They don't want a real debate on the topic of race and IQ. They want to engage in a charade of diversionary tactics. They want to attack people personally and attack their purported political views instead of judging evidence for the existence of racial variations in cognitive functioning on its own merits. They prejudicially reject any and all hereditary explanations for consistently observed aggregate patterns of performance on IQ and SAT tests by race. They can't defend, on scientific grounds, the ludicrously implausible position that racial variations in any and all measures of cognitive performance are 100% explainable by environmental factors and 0% by genetic factors. This is a dogmatic, ideologically derived, a priori position. And the only way they can defend it is by touting its ethical superiority. They don't want a debate on whether environmental influences only or a combination of environmental and genetic influences best explains the consistency and persistency of the racial distributions of IQ and SAT scores. That's the position taken by race realists, that both nature and nurture play a role. The opponents of race realism don't want to have to argue positively for a nurture-only theory. They can't come up with one that explains the totality of the data going back decades. And that's why Sophia Rune doesn't want to have a debate with me. Sophia has steadfastly refused to even offer a position that could be debated. Philippe Rushton posits a 50% genetic, 50% environmental explanation for the racial IQ variances. Sophia sneers at that, but offers no argument for any alternative explanation. I ascribe a bit larger weighting to genetics than does Rushton, and Sophia sneers at me, but again she offers no argument for any alternative explanation for the racial IQ variances. Now, I didn't seek out a debate with Sophia Roon. I regard my previous videos addressing her disingenuous skepticism as sufficient. Uh, in the comment section of yet another video making a petty attack on Rushton's character instead of addressing the substance of his argument, Sophia decided to challenge me to a debate. So I decided that yes, even though my previous videos have said pretty much everything I care to say about Sophia publicly, I would be willing to have a debate. And since she made a sneering remark at race realists in the same comment section d dedicated to the uh, petty character assault against Rushton, that we should have a debate over race realism and whether her objections to race realism are scientifically well-founded. So the position that I told her I would be willing to defend in the debate is opposition to race realism isn't scientifically tenable. Now it's kind of awkwardly worded, but her position would be that opposition to race realism is scientifically tenable. Now race realism is a vague term not so vague that Sophia isn't willing to use it anyway, but some specifics do need to be spelled out for the purposes of a debate, so I did that for her, and I stated that race realism entails the positive view that racial IQ disparities have some hereditary explanation. So race realists positively assert that environment-only explanations are false. My debate topic does not give Sophia the burden of having to falsify hereditarian explanations. She need merely show that it is scientifically tenable to reject them. But incredibly, Sophia declined to debate me on this topic. She insisted that I argue for a specific heritability percentage, 
while she, of course, would refuse to argue for any specific percentage at all. And she wouldn't have to put her cards on the table at all. She wouldn't have to argue for 0% heritability or 10% or whatever number she actually believes. All she would have to do is raise doubts about my very specific, narrow position. That doesn't strike me as fair. By contrast, I think my question was very fair. And so I wrote back to her and said, this is at root a philosophical debate. I seek to defend the realist position in its essence against the competing approaches, not argue a specific assertion that may follow from race realism. You don't have to defend 0% heritability in order to refute me. You just have to show that it's tenable to reject hereditarian explanations as unproven, not prove that they're wrong. That's your whole shtick, isn't it? All you have to do is defend it. But she's not willing to. Opposition to race realism is untenable on purely scientific grounds. Opponents of hereditarian explanations for racial differences in cognitive performance don't base their opposition on scientific principles or data. They base it on non-scientific, subjective, moralistic premises that they employ to contravene the scientific method. I do not believe that we should dignify this man and his ideas in public debate. I am outraged. I am outraged at these monstrous claims. Where are those hotshot molecular geneticists whose work he's citing, who gladly go for grants on biotechnology but don't get up when it comes to an important social issue? In allowing him to continue his work and spread his ideas and providing research funding in allowing his articles to be published, scientists and scholars legitimate his work and must be condemned for a serious dereliction of responsibility. You see, there will always be Russians in the world. And we must always be prepared to root them out and not hide behind academic freedom. But to deal with these matters implies that there is a proper, that, that, that there is a proper uh, question, that he's a legitimate question to his work, and there isn't. We don't say, no, we have to have academic freedom to treat or use new drugs and test them on people or inject viruses into people without complying with certain requirements. Or even, or even increasingly on animals, we, we subscribe to certain rules and regulations on that. I, uh, over, the, over these data, they simply are not worth dwelling on because they seem to give legitimacy to what he's claiming. Your response to some of the stuff he was saying is, I mean, I think is, is indicative of that we must look at this and simply say this isn't science. Either way, what has to be done is action by scientists and academics. His claims must be denounced, his methodology di discredited, his grant revoked, and his position terminated at this university. And you at the University of Washington are besmirched by it. Uh, Dr. Suzuki says that my ideas on race are too esoteric. And he shows, however, little more than moral outrage. He says that people like me should be rooted out. And if I heard correctly, uh, he actually called for me to be fired. Well, that is not a scientific argument. Subjective moralistic premises that they employ to contravene the scientific method. And as evidence, I'll quote here from someone more prominent than Sophia Roon, anthropologist Leonard Lieberman, who authored a paper in which he supposedly endeavored to refute Rushton. Lieberman writes, the fundamental question is not whose brain is smaller or larger, but how social inequities might be reduced by social methods. Well, that's his personal opinion, but whether social inequities, however he defines them, should be reduced by social methods, however he defines them, is outside the scope of science. You can study social inequities, however defined scientifically, but you can't show that social inequities, however defined, 
are bad scientifically, but assuming that one agrees with Lieberman's subjective opinion, one would have to undertake an effort to ascertain the extent to which social inequities are a result of innate factors, because you cannot know the extent to which social inequities can be reduced by social methods alone unless you know the extent to which existing inequities are the product of social forces and not of genetic forces. So in order to have an opinion on how or to what extent SAT scores could be equalized by race, you would have to have an opinion as to what extent the existing SAT distributions are governed by innate factors pertaining to cognitive abilities. Yet in the next sentence, Lieberman says, the question of which race has the largest cranial size and the highest intelligence lacks conceptual and empirical merit. The question itself, never mind any particular conclusion, so according to Lieberman, you shouldn't even ask the very question that would be necessary in order to gain information about the extent to which social inequities can be reduced by social methods. In other words, Lieberman's professed belief in pursuing equality of outcomes functions as an article of faith. Lieberman concludes, Attention to whether Europeans or Asians are number one in the hierarchy obscures the fact that the major consequence of the hierarchy is to justify the exploitation of those at the bottom. Well, Lieberman again obscures the distinction between fact and opinion. It is not a fact that the major consequence of the hierarchy itself is to justify anything let alone exploitation of anybody. Even if it could be shown that belief in racial variations in averages for cognitive capacity lead to exploitation, it would not follow that the variations don't exist. Thomas Jefferson, in a letter to abolitionist Henry Gregoire, expressed his doubt as to blacks being as innately well endowed mentally as whites. But Jefferson said, whatever be their degree of talent, it is no measure of their rights. Because Sir Isaac Newton was superior to others in understanding, he was not therefore lord of the person or property of others.